Welcome to today's IOC People, and I'm very pleased to be joined by one of our very newest church members, Jacques Mattia. Welcome, Jacques. Great to have you here. So, Jacques, um, tell us a bit about yourself. Does it start from the beginning? Uh, something about your family, your background, where you grew up? Okay, first of all, let me just say, I'm from Dutch Reform background. Mm. <laughs> I grew up in a in a small then fishing village in Manus, way back in well primary school days, 1957. Um, my father was the Dutch Reform minister, mm. and um, we were five kids, four boys and one girl. I was number three. Mm. And uh, I, I was, I never got new clothes. I was used to wearing hand-me-downs. You know? <laughs> it was just the way it was. Yeah. And that's the way I grew up. We had a station wagon. We all piled into it. No safety belts in those days. Mm. Three in front and the rest of the back. Yeah. And um, that's how we lived. Um, we were a very happy family. Um, and my dad worked very hard, you know, so we didn't really see much of him, mm. which is a bit, a big pity. Um, and he was really a big leader in the town, you know, this little mm. town, um, respected amongst all the different denominations. He, um, even the Jewish um, fraternity, they, they actually invited him to special meetings and so on. He, mm. he had his own yamaka and so on. Mm. Um, and yeah, so he even took part in plays that uh, amateur society put up and so on and so on. Um, unfortunately, he was not a very well, a healthy guy and at the age of 42, he died of a heart attack. Mm. So yeah, so we were five kids. My mum was four years older than my dad, so she was 46. And uh, I must perhaps just tell you a bit about this lady. You know, she was a formidable lady. Mm. She, she was 29 when she got married, which was quite old in those days. And by that stage, she, had, she was a teacher by training. By that stage, she did a few years in King Williamstown before she got married. And then the war hit them, and then, you know, she was getting a bit tired of all the war news and, and, and also felt that so many men went to war and did their part. She also wanted to do something unusual. So she took a job for a year, a job as, a, as, as the teacher at a one-man school for 20 kids in the Tankwa Karoo, now that's about 100 kilometers north of Sierras in the middle of the Karoo, Hansfontein. So Hansfontein was this little house in the school and she was there for a year, you know, doing everything for the kids. The kids stayed there as well. Very poor um, kids from farming communities. And uh, anyway, so that's the sort of character she was. She really mm. tackled things. Um, then she was the pastorie mother and Dominus of Fro at Amanus. And uh, she had to do all the prayer meetings and things like that. And I think she adapted very, very well. Hmm. But she always had this free spirit. And, hmm. and she never let us um, as kids feel done in because my dad wasn't around. Yeah. And she would allow us to after school and you've done your homeworks, you would allow you to, if you want to go fishing or swimming in the tidal pool mm. or whatever, she would never interfere. Mm. And we always, you know, had 10 or so kids playing at our house. You know, that was the main spot, the den. Mm. And uh, so there was a lot of freedom and so on and so on. So when my dad died, you know, she, she immediately was offered a job at the local school within a week. Mm. And, and so, you know, for the, it was middle of the year, so for six months she taught there. 
and we obviously had to plan things. And she realized that she couldn't stay with this big family in Amanas, the small town, because the next Dumini would have a problem with this um, existing uh, 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 colleague's wife and kids mm, mm. in town. And it was also difficult for my mom. We were growing up to prevent us from going dancing or doing other things you know, in this very conservative town. Yes. So she decided to try and get a, a job where she grew up. And she was offered a, the job as a vice principal of a, of a primary school, girls' school, in Worcester. Okay. She started in 64. We moved to Worcester because her family was from Worcester. And she knew that she would be supported there and she knew also that we would get fatherly sort of figures mm. you know, amongst the family. So, so we moved to Worcester. Obviously, it's never fun for kids to move. You yeah. know? So we moved to Worcester. I went to the Worcester Boys Eye yeah. School, which is a substantially bigger school than the Amana School, mm. and uh, became just one of the guys, you know? Mm. And, um, anyway, I wasn't too fond of high school. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't my go back. But anyway, so we arrived at Worcester in 64, beginning 64. And that April, 10 months after my dad died, my eldest brother died in a, in a mountain accident. Mm. Um, he went to a, a Christian camp close by in Sirius. And he, he, they had a mountain accident and he died. And obviously that was a huge shock to us all. Wow, losing your father and your eldest brother. Yeah, within a year, less than a year, 10 years. Yeah. But, but you know, my father was unfortunately absent. You know, he was yeah. busy working. Mm. We never saw him. Mm. And, but my brother was my brother. Mm. Um, so obviously, you know, that really, um, that, that was quite, quite a shock. And, um, but you know, my mom, uh, her faith was so strong and she basically, um, you know, we, we never felt the, the troubled water, you know, we to hold it together. Yeah, and... We sort of stabilized and, um, well, her, her brother, my uncle was just living a block away from us. So him and his wife were absolutely my second home, you mm. know. So ugh, he taught us to fish and to mountain climb and to do all <laughs> sorts of things. So we had, um, it was a good, good, um, stable setup. Yes. But my mom really taught me, you know, that um, God doesn't prevent issues happening to you. But he's there. He's definitely there, and he's definitely a support to us at all times. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was to me a very important um, uh, learning curve in my life. And so you you did your high school in in Worcester. Worcester, right? And and were you a good student? Uh, you said you didn't particularly uh, like school, but you know, did you have a sense of what you wanted to do with your life as you went you through know, school? Russell, I, yeah, I thought I knew, you know, I was a bit bored at school and I mm. wasn't so chuffed with the teachers. You know, when I saw my, the school my kids went to, which is the local Pinelands school, I realized how good teachers can be, you know, mm. and mine weren't good. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I managed to get through. And um, I didn't really know what to do. I mean, you know, we didn't know what an engineer was, you know, in our family or set up. We, you know, you knew doctors, you knew yes. lawyers and teachers and policemen. But... <laughs> policemen, you know. So when I got to the end of my school career, we had a, a guidance guy there. But, you know, he just looked at my marks and he said, Hugh, man, you need to do BSc and you need to make sure that you go work in the, in the lab or in the back, back room because you mustn't work with people either, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But do engineering, you can do engineering if you want to. So, so I applied for bursaries and I got a 
bursary from the Worcester, local Worcester municipality for studying civil engineering at Stellenbosch. Okay. So I thought, well, that's good enough. You know, it's yeah. BSc. I really didn't have a clue what engineers do. And there was just nobody guiding me. You know, nowadays, I mean, I've had so, so many basically youngsters. this person chose this career for you. It wasn't oh, something. Yeah. yeah. Well, he said to me, don't go anywhere else. Go there, you know. Yeah. But wow. he didn't even tell me what engineers do or gave me a brochure and say, I'm going. So you went in faith. Oh, faith, yes, faith. No, it wasn't quite. I think... I well, think if, 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 taking his word that this would be a good for, thing for uh, you. But yeah, that, yeah, that type of faith, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, it was, uh, it was going there. So, so what actually happened was I, um, going to Vasti, I wasn't a good, engineer, a good student either, I must tell you that, <laughs> before you ask me. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> so, so I was easily enticed by by anything else, any other fun things happening that that needed <laughs> some organisation or whatever. So, you know, if the carnival was on the go and the the hostel needed somebody to run the carnival show, hey, I was there mm. and I would plan it and organise it mm. to a T and come up with the best solution yeah. and best float and whatever. And then, you know, the, the Christian organization also had contacts in, in Zululand, Swaziland, John Sky to build churches and schools during holidays. Mm. And I, I volunteered for that, you know. Yeah. I wasn't close to the Christian Bible school or, or studying or doing Bible study or anything, you know. I, I wasn't so involved with that at that point, but yeah, you know, I was keen to do this. Okay. So, so yeah. And how was Stellenbosch University for you that, that experience? Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't a good student, but I was bored. You know, it's yeah. again, it wasn't, um, it wasn't really enlightening. It wasn't. Yeah. There wasn't. I, you know, I didn't really even see where I was going. I, I, but you managed to pass. And, I passed, and, finally, yeah, finally. Yeah. And get through. And uh, having graduated from Stellenbosch, what did you do then? Well, it is, uh, I just wanted, wanted to tell you, the third time we went on one of these camps, yeah. we built uh, quite a big church, an A-frame church, um, A-frame roof church. And the guy who was supposed to run it, he, it was out of his depth. He was out of his depth. Mm. So I took over. And I started project managing this church. Mm. And I had to tell the medics who were build, busy building brickwork, and I had to tell them, hey, guys, I'm sorry, but the work that you did yesterday, you're going to have to break down because you've got no bond there. Mm. And, and third year medics, you know, yeah. they wouldn't listen to anybody. And they said to me, hey, man, are you sure you're right? You're right. I said, yes, there's no bond. That wall will fall off. Come and break it down, or I'm going to have to break it down. So, yeah. so I was actually taking over this project job, and yeah. then I then realized construction is my field. You know, yeah. that's where I'm, I'm heading. I, I couldn't see myself as a municipal engineer sitting behind a desk and yeah. planning this yeah. boring, as far as I was concerned, yeah. work. So, so when I finished, then the municipality, and that's where faith comes in, I yeah. guess. That something will, the right thing will happen. Wisdom Municipality said to me, hey, I'm very sorry, but the, the economy is so down, we don't have a job for you. So, you know, we can't offer you a job. So, so I was even though able, they paid for your bursary, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to, to actually go and find a job that I, that I would, that suited me. Yeah. So I got a job with LTA construction, which is, um, yeah, and, and the first job was was a huge bridge at George, mm. um, 20 meter high structure, and um, uh, it was sort of halfway, they, they sort of, the bridge was halfway constructed when I arrived. Um, but, but anyway, that's, that's just answering you, how did I get to construction? Yeah. yeah. So, but that, that started you on a whole career yeah. of building yeah, true. significant <laughs> structures, you know, because mm. that's with civil engineering, you're not just building for, 
for private use you're building no. for oh, it's basically infrastructure, infrastructure that, that, that yeah. everyone takes advantage of. And, yeah, yeah. and uh, just maybe talk us through how that developed for you, you know. Hmm. Yeah, Russell. So, so obviously the first one being this job at George, you know, you you really have to learn the trade because you come from Vasti, you haven't got a clue. Mm. I mean, you 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 really learn from the foreman, you know, and and methods that are used and things like that, you know. So, yeah. I mean, the first day I thought I said to the foreman came to me, he said to me, "Hey, you better get on to." Pier number one, because we've got to put the pier head out. The carpenters are waiting for lines. We're busy building, you know. Yeah. You've got to better get up there. So I said to him, but, you know, where do I, where are my stations? Where do I set up my theodolite to work from the sides? Mm. So he said, no. In those days, he called everybody cuppy from carpenter. He said, no, mm. cuppy, up there. Mm. You get yourself up there. This is Enoch. He's your sidekick. He will make sure all your instruments get there, but you get yourself up there. Yeah. So I had to climb those scaffolds. Wow. <laughs> 20 meters of scaffolding. Hand over hand. Yeah. I went. I, I had this funny room, sort of, I could feel there was something happening on site. Yeah. The next moment, as I looked over my shoulder, there were 200 guys all stopped their jobs and they were all watching me going up the scaffold. You know, I got to the top, they all cheered me. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, that was the start of it. Um, so so I, I loved, I worked for them for six years. I loved my job. I loved sort of, you know, this type of constructing, seeing finally this project or this structure was built from scratch by you, you know, mm. you involved from scratch. That is really, it gave you sort of a feeling of accomplish, yeah. accomplishing something yeah. significantly. But also, they all varied, you know, being civil, cont uh, civil structures, they often, they, they're very few of them that are, 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 are repeats. Mm. And then at the end of that six year period with LTA, I often had to do, um, I, I was sent to difficult jobs where, the, the the team just didn't manage to to meet targets and so on, and I had to go and help out with programming and and yeah. methods and so on and so on. So I, really, I enjoyed that. That really taught me a lot of of the you know, the, the controlling of contracts. I was then whew, 32, and I was now getting tired of living out of suitcases and and never settling down. And uh, I suppose I wanted to, to find a wife for myself. Mm. So I came to Cape Town and I found a job. I, I um, started a job at Basil Stark, a civil engineering company based in Cape Town. Okay. And they were looking for a guy to do their structure division, to, to actually develop and build their structure division. Mm. So. The, so a new phase started. So I had to now, and nobody had taught me this. No, nowhere do they teach you how to tender on a job, you mm. know. So you, from basic <laughs> basics, you have to basically build up a price over a very short period of what, how you're going to construct this this job. So I had to learn that. In, in so. Um, I started, I mean, the first big job I had was when I was um, uh, 34, and that was the toll plaza at the Rijunut Tunnel. Oh, so wow. if you go up to the Rijunut Tunnel, you come onto that big concrete slab where the, the pay booths are. Yeah. So that's 20,000 square meters of paving, and it's 230 mil thick. Yeah. And that finish at the top has got to be absolutely to spec. You know, there, there, there's, a, there's a special time marking you've got to do when the concrete is just at the right stage, yeah. which, which actually gives little um, uh, scratches or grooves in the concrete face, which mm. allows water to disperse if, 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 it's, you know, if it's raining. Yeah. And if you don't get that right, they actually reject that slab. So 
So you had to protect it during rainy days or stop. You know, you to, it was quite a tricky job for a youngster, you know, yeah. and, and, and I had to price it and I had to come up. I, uh, I was, uh, had to win that job and it was, it was the start. Now, I'm a con I was a contractor all my life and a big, big structure. So, so so for instance, this is, this is Arsenal Ben, you know? Yeah. So, that's one of my last contracts I did. Wow. So, it's a sort of, you know, Context manager designing this thing and then building, you know, supervising it directly. Sure. So I remember that project happening and you and boys were you yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and now you can go straight from the N2 onto the N3 with a Yeah, if you do it properly, most people don't. They still It's only one little lane, I think, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is one of the other bridges. And I could just show you the stages that you go through. Because most people don't really know what's what happens. Okay, that's Hospital Ben contract, and um, you know, as a as a contract and manager, you basically at the end of stage, you have to understand the drawings and the design and all the complications and the and the specifications. Like for instance, we weren't allowed to stop the traffic ever, besides four days of the week from uh, 11 o'clock at night till five o'clock in the morning. So that gave us time to just move on the road, but the rest of the time you basically, you had to stay off the road. So the design was really to, to get um, the support work in place that um, allowed us then to, to work whilst the traffic was running to work on this platform. So, um, <laughs> you guys know, this is the Val Road. So this is the new bridge, the old bridge is there. So this is 15 meters up in the sky. So there's a very narrow little island here and you have to support these 15 meter high towers and keep them stable. So we came up with a way of actually putting cable struts in, we drill 20 meters into the ground. Wonderful. Um, crowded them in and then we had to brace this whole thing. And then this was put up with cranes. But you know, once this structure was up, then I could have my guys sitting here in the structure at night mm. with block and tackles, these chain blocks. Yeah. And so there are 12 guys there and they would just drop their chain blocks and pick up the platforms and slowly bring it up and make sure nobody pinches their fingers or, or you know, the wind wouldn't actually stop them. So, and then we would bolt it together. Yeah. And the second picture? This one is actually Anzio Road. So the Anzio Road bridge is the one a little bit lower down. It's a very unusual bridge. It sort of is a 360 degree sort of turn. And, um, so this is where the main <clears throat> incoming traffic lanes are. Mm. So that gap, we had to construct under traffic. Mm. So we had to put up the girders and then the soffit was very similar to that soffit, was actually brought up during the night um, and positioned at the right angles and, so, and slopes. And then we can, could construct our traditional shape on top of the platform without being interfered with. You know, so during the day, you actually could, could, could work here uninterrupted. Mm -hmm. And then after the concrete was cast and so on and so on, you then needed night work occupation of the road to be able to strip down. And this is, this is the stripping down phase. In other words, there the guys are actually letting a panel down. Um, yeah, we've got a cherry picker. And in fact, that is me standing there looking at a defect that we picked up, you know, when we stripped. So we had to fix that, patch it up, you know, while, while we had a chance. Because, you know, the next morning traffic would be full on. <laughs> and uh, so I had lots of fun. <laughs> it 
the, in the, yeah, anyway, the, in this specific instance, Russell, the one problem was it's so complicated because you've got this very sharp curve and you're on a super elevation and inside the, the structure itself, you've got voids and you've got pre-stressed ducts and you've got reinforcing that you know, you just, you just can't move. And then you've got the supports running through to support everything. So it was incredibly complicated. And yeah, luckily I had uh, very good engineers working with me. Wonderful. Yeah. So in the, yeah. earlier on in, in one of my previous companies, or I, I worked with, this is one of the things, and it's just unusual and people often don't know these things. This is a caisson that we constructed. It was a pump station at Tiervatus Kloof. So you, when you go on the way from Fabum to Verleersdorf, you see this pump station in the, within the dam. And, and that's where water is pumped from you know, to a pipeline. But to construct this, you had to, go, you had to build it with a floating caisson. And this is the floating caisson. So it's a, it's a bit like a... You know, if you take a quiche dish and you put it in a basin, yeah. you could float it, you know? And then, but finally, this was built in 30 meters of water. So, wow. so we, had to, we had to build this quiche dish in a, in a dry dock and then float it into the dam yeah. and then put it, float it and anchor it where we were going to construct. And then slowly, you actually incrementally build it high and higher. So finally, the design looks like a beer glass, a tall, thin, slender beer glass, because it's 20 meters high. So it's a seven-story building that we built in 30 meters of water, you know? Wow. So you can imagine if you sit in your tub tonight bathing and you sit, take a beer glass hmm. after you finished it, you try and balance it. Mm. All you do is you put some water or leave some beer in it and it will stabilize it. So during the construction, you know, we started with a quiche dish and then we slowly built this beer glass and <laughs> kept it stable until mm. we got to the final stage, which is a bit too complicated to explain now. Wow. But um, this is, it's actually lots of fun. You know, I was just short of 40. That was my foreman partner. Um, and you know, you can see it's just fun, it's just fun, you know, and it worked out <laughs> Not so quite well. quite sitting in an office every day. <laughs> no, it was lots of fun. And this poor company went bankrupt a year later, but this contract was making good money. And uh, yeah, it was just fun. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Jack, okay. no, nice yeah, idea. Of, this is one of my earlier ones where, yeah, I was about 34. Oh, what was I, 37. So this is the Tsitsikama. You know, the Tsitsikama gorges are incredibly complex because they're very deep gorges, weak rocks and so on and so on. Mm. So it's not a very long bridge. It's about 100 meters. You ride over it, close the storms river. You won't even know it, you know, because it, it's, it feels like a culvert. But it's massive in construction. And I was a youngster having to come up with this design and having to build it and then move it from this bridge to the next bridge. So this was Vetterklip, mm -hmm. the Elans boss is the next one. And to keep uh, everything working. <laughs> I lost a lot of hair during that time, I tell you. And my poor wife, she had small kids and she had to basically put up with this yeah. guy who was totally stressed at times. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, coming to Cape Town in search of a wife. Was your search successful? <laughs> yeah, I. <laughs> yeah, it 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 was successful in the end, but um, it was a long route. Eh? And <laughs> I mean, I met Ingrid previously when I stayed. I I was still with the previous company. I met her on a blind date, and. Um, and she wasn't impressed with my leather jacket and my style. And <laughs> I wasn't impressed with all the little hearts in her flat. You know, she had, oof, she had a, she just came back from Europe and she had this heart phase. So there were hearts all over the place, you know. Mm. And I thought, yeah, 
I just I couldn't quite work this out. But anyway, so we we didn't start off very well, but we um, we we got on very well as we got to know one another. And and you know, she loved um, handwork. Mm. She had a passion for handwork, and um, and so did I. And, um, and we both appreciated that from from each other. I was yeah. doing jewelry at the time, so yeah. it was my hobby. So yeah. I was doing jewelry, and um, and she appreciated that. And um, and you know, Russell, she was <laughs> one of the few really deeply honest girls I met, ladies I met, you know, she could really, there was, nothing was hidden, you know, it was spelled out from the start and no second agendas, you know, so, so, and I had actually, you know, I was 32, I thought I was quite an experienced guy, you know, yeah. met many, many ladies and many girls, lots of fun, yeah. but I, but, you know, I, that actually, um, made the deal. But anyway, I, <laughs> Ingrid always jokes about it because I, I had a bucky always, so I had to move her things, I think for three times from one flat to the next or from one. You're right. So I knew her things quite well and, and I had to fix the, you know, and all these old flats, there always are problems with the plumbing and so on. So mm -hmm. I had to fix a toilet forever, you know? Yeah. So I remember once, fixing the toilet and while I was on my knees I said to her, Ingrid, when are you gonna get married? When are you gonna get married to me? <clears throat> Sorry, when are you gonna get married to me? So she said to me, Well, that sounds like a good proposal. So we got married there while I was on my knees next to a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, okay. <laughs> Perhaps you should edit that, honestly. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> well, you got, that was the proposal. Well, you, you didn't get married then. You know. No, 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 no. But no. Uh, that was the start of it yeah. when the decision no, was taken. No, well, it taken. happened very fast then. You know, yeah. once we, you know, we had known one another for quite a while. Yeah. And she, oh, she resisted this, you know, she didn't want this Afrikaner guy mm. to get too close to her. I don't know, it was just a slow process. And then um, finally when she, when she gave in, she, it happened fast. All right, <laughs> wonderful. And you've been together for how many years now? Oh, 37, is it? Oh, yep. it'll be, yeah. Oh, no, it's more than that. So my math suddenly has dropped me. No, that we, sounds about right. <laughs> 32 and you're 71, so it's about 39 years. So it's, it's a long time. Uh, Wonderful. And how many children do you have? I've got two kids. Yeah. Mm, 37 and 30. So we must have been married for longer than that. Yeah. 39 years. Wonderful. So we, um, Nicole is 37 and Karen is 35. Right. Okay. And they're both in Cape Town. Mm. Both married. And you have grandchildren? Yes, yes. We've we've got three boys. Yeah. From the eldest one, Nicole. Mm. And um, my youngest daughter, Karen, she's she's now expecting within the next six weeks. Right. Also a boy. So we'll have you know Wonderful. A lot of boys around. Yeah. But then the career in construction continued to, to flourish and yeah. uh, you've been involved in numerous big projects yes. over the years, I gather. Um, and I think you're going to tell us about some of those. And, uh, but yeah, just give us, uh, you know, has your career given you a lot of joy? Has it been, you know, something you've, you, you've loved doing? I yeah. know some people get up and they have to work to make a living. Other people, it's a passion. Mm. No, Russell, it's a passion. Um, you know, every job was different. I I need variety in my life, and ugh, every job was different. And you must remember, if you 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 have a hit rate often of about one in five with with construction. So what does that mean? So that means you're going to tender on five contracts oh, before you get one. All right. So, and every contract that you tender on, I, or in any case, every tender I worked on was the one I was going to win because otherwise I wouldn't price it. Yes. And I got enthused about it and I really worked. You get about a month to tender on this thing. So you've yeah. got to think it through and, 
and work it through and compete with your competitors. You know, you knew the guys well and you knew how every guy thought. And so you, so there was this huge competition on. And, uh, and so, so, yeah, so I, I, it never, I never got bored, I tell you that. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. And Jacques, tell us a little bit about your journey of faith. You said you, you, you were born into a Dutch reform family with, you know, your father was a, was a minister. Um, you know, were you part of the Dutch reform church for a long time? I mean, just talk us through that a little bit, you know, how the faith journey developed. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I obviously grew up with, you know, I, I knew exactly um, how my parents felt about God. And, and my mum, she really was obviously our, the, the key guide in our lives. So we had evening prayers after supper. So we, we, um, we really reflected on the day and it was, yeah, it was sort of part of the day, you know, so that was very, I think, very key. But then, you know, as you get older, went to varsity, you know, I sort of moved away a little bit. Mm. And then during these camps, you know, I really went just for fun, you know, these mm. construction camps. And then on the third one, I started getting to know um, leaders, Christian leaders, and and I started to actually slowly get back into this, what is this all about? Mm. And, and then I discovered my dad's library because obviously you couldn't so easily find sort of, um, you know, uh, guidance and, and mm. literature you know, lay people couldn't easily get access to yeah. Barclays and, yeah. and various interpretations. Mm. My dad's library was there. So mm. I, I was suddenly, at the age of about 22, mm. I was really, um, I was inspired. I actually, I remember reading through Andrew Murray's one book in Afrikaans, I can't actually understand that Afrikaans at this stage. If you ask me to read it now, you know, it's so <laughs> old fashioned. Yes. But I, um, so, you know, so it, it had a huge influence in my life at that point. Mm. And then again, you know, during that phase, sort of working and early, early life, bachelor life, you sort of move away slightly. I wasn't mm. fixed. The, uh, uh, I didn't stay at any place to really to, yeah. to, to, to be part of a congregation. Yeah. So it's only when, when Ingrid and I got married, she came from a Lutheran church background, yeah. very strict Lutheran church mm. upbringing. Um, German, mm. so our kids really, you know, they were their mother tongue was German, and um, I was from the Dutch Reformed Church, and we were, we we started off in Pinelands because we wanted our kids to be in a town where they could do their own thing, go to school on their own, and so on and so on. We naively thought at that point, yeah. but but. Um, the Dutch Reform Minister at Pinelands, I actually knew well. He was mm. from my hometown, uh, Johannes Kurnoff. He was a very together guy. And um, the two of us chatted to him, and he said to us, you know what, I think I would suggest you move away from your denominations and go to a third independent denomination of your choice, you mm. know? Um, because you'll never have conflicts in, within your relationship again about, you know, okay. this is your church, Sir Russell, you know. Yes, not mine. Is, I, I'm not quite part of it, you know. Yeah. I would have, anyway. So we both decided the Presbyterian Church in Pinelands was actually perhaps the best call for us. Mm. It was closer to both the denominations we came from. Mm -hmm. I had an interesting, when my 
my, when we were in Amarnas and being Afrikaans, my mum had a connection with a Pinans Presbyterian Church minister who was Scottish, yeah. Reverend Gray. And um, their kids wanted to learn Afrikaans and our kids wanted to learn English. So for two holidays, we would swap. Two of us would go there and two of them would come to us. So I had a connection to that church. And, um, and we, we both actually felt, you know, it's, it, it would suit us. So we went to, to, to that church. It, it was, um, um, yeah. For many years, I guess. Many years, yes. Um, so, so our kids grew up there, went to Sunday school. We became part of the furniture. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Until recently. Until very recently. So yeah. I was actually on the property committee. Yeah. I found myself in the end being the property committee. <laughs> and it's a big church, as you know. Mm. And uh, I mean, we had to replace the roof at one stage. We, we, um, it's a massive church with lots of other, you know, the structure was big. Um, so I spent many hours in that roof catching water as it leaked and sort of tracing it and yeah. finding, you know, so, and things like that. So, um, but unfortunately the church, um, uh, just shrunk, and mm. as, as many churches do. And uh, with COVID, it really took a huge knock. And um, so it got to a point where it just became too small to function, really. Yeah. Um, and we, we know a few people that, that have come to RUC. Mm. And we because of COVID, we were able to to go online and follow a lot of the, yes. the, the, the broadcasts. Um, Robert actually, when our kids were small, Robert was a guest speaker or teach, uh, a minister at our church in Pinans once. Mm. And um, he had a marimba band going and <laughs> the kids thought this was the best thing out, you know? Yeah. And we, we liked his style. And, um, but anyway, that was years ago. And then oh, quite recently at Pinus Presbyterian Church, we, we, we asked Robert to come and chat to us about, um, about various things. And um, it was really just about uh, the LBGQT. Yeah, LGBTQ. LGBTQI, sorry, yeah. Russell. Um, uh, issues and how a church, how you as a modern church would handle it. Yeah. And Robert was such a, he had such a clear way of handling it, you know. Yeah. So I was, both Ingrid and I, Ingrid was also at the meeting, we were both so impressed with, with the way he and REC handles it. Yeah. And we, um, we, we then had an opportunity because of COVID to slowly come when the church opened, we slowly yeah. came to a few services. In fact, the, uh, there were a few services at the back outside one day, it was yeah. raining even and yeah. oh man, it was, I suddenly felt so at home and we both felt there was such a, such an incredibly um, solid group of people that, that have been drawn here. Yeah. And so we feel very at home. Yeah, well, it's great to have you as part of it. Yeah. Jacques, I know Ingrid has also had some quite serious health challenges recently, mm. and that's meant big changes to both of your lives. Would you like to tell us a little bit about how that's been for you? Yeah. Look, um, the condition is orthostatic tremor. So it basically means that when she stands, she can't stand for long, then mm. she starts tremoring. So um, that meant that she couldn't really, she, she can't really easily shop, mm. you know, and she can't cook or she can't do the full process. You know, mm. she would obviously be busy sitting somewhere, peeling things yeah. and so on and so on. So, 
that was one of my new projects now, you know, I had to, to plan my shopping, um, plan the menus with her and then go shopping and then yeah. do the cooking and so on. I didn't mind cooking. I, I had actually cooked before in my life, mm. but this is not really, it's different when you cook, you have to cook every night, you know, mm. and you can't moan at your husband and say, hey, when are we having a take out, take yeah. out or <laughs> yeah. let's go for a meal out? Because also our conditions, I also have a condition. So we both actually restricted in what we can eat. So it's not so easy to eat out. Right. You know? So that's been a big thing. And then also traveling is a, is, is, is a big issue. We can't easily travel, yeah. which was um, obviously one, one has always had these dreams, you know, of still traveling. In retirement when you've got the time sure. and the money. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That is, that's been tough. But, you know, there's so many other pluses that came also with, with, uh, within the relationship because of that. Yes. Oh, sure. I'm sure you yeah. get to know each other and rely on each other in different ways. To, to yeah. Before. And so you are now retired. Um, yes. For, uh, for how long have you been retired? And as someone who loved your career, was that difficult? <clears throat> and is that difficult? Mm. And how do you spend your time? What gives you joy and energy in these you know, latter years? I've been retired for eight years, Russell. So we, in construction, you know, guys get worn out. So this company I ended up with, they you had to retire at 60. Yeah. So I still continued till 63. Um, they wanted me to stay on just to do the tendering. Mm. But you know, you, you, I felt you can't tender and then hand it over to somebody else because they always find fault with your tender. <laughs> okay. It doesn't work out. So I decided you have a clean break and I'm still pleased I did that. Mm. But you know, I fill my time with other projects, you know, so it's either um, helping my kids to build on something or changing our holiday home or um, my vegetable garden. Yeah. Are you still doing your jewelry? I do. I don't do a lot anymore because my youngest daughter is a jeweler hmm. and she um, makes beautiful things. So no, I've got no takers. <laughs> so you have, you have to have a market to be able to 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 know what you're doing, you know. So or where do you go? What are you what are you making, or who do you make it for? Yeah. So, but I'm actually keen to get back into it now again. Yeah. And um, so I've still got my my workbench, and yeah. yeah, I've been doing this for for, for 44 years. So, yeah. It's, so it's always been a hobby alongside your career. Mm, yes. Yeah. And what kind of jewelry? Um, oh, various things, pennants and rings and so on. But I always strive to do my own design and something different and something more complicated. And, and um, yeah, so, so I think they're nice. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the but you know, also even during my construction years, I would actually have my jewelry top, the top of the table, yeah. and that's the first thing I packed in. So when I got to Human's Door mm. or Somerset East, you know, I would actually clamp that top onto another table, and mm. then the first night I would be out working mm. my jewelry. It's just it was just my go-to. It was my way of relaxing and switching off. Yeah. Mm. So what's next for you? Any exciting things on the horizon? Yeah. Well, my kids and their and the grandchildren, they keep us occupied. They, you know, it, it's lots of fun. And, and yeah, I do mountaineering. I, I, I realize that <clears throat> it's not something that will, you'll be able to do forever. So, I mean, yesterday I still managed to go to the top of Table Mountain. Wow. And, um, and while I can still stay fit and um, enjoy this, I mean, that is to me a great honor. Mm. Thank you, Jacques. It's been great to get to know you a bit better. 
And it's been wonderful to have you and Ingrid as part of our church here. Yeah, and, thanks, Razo. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks a lot.